Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. Really pleased to be with you all. Um, I'm here today to talk about my book, Worth It. Um, it just recently came out. Uh, it came out on the five-year anniversary of me standing in front of Gravity Payments and announcing that I was taking a million-dollar pay cut so that everybody at Gravity could make at least $70,000 per year. So it was five years to the day. Of course, when we picked that day, we did not expect that that would be in the middle of a pandemic. So it's been uh, a bit different than what we expected. And uh, I've been so focused on um, helping our small business clients have the solutions they need to, um, to, to continue to be able to work hard and, and try to save their business that I have not really put um, much time or energy into promoting uh, my book. But it's not because of lack of excitement or, or, or um, being proud of it. Um, so I just wanted to um, talk about what we're going to do today, which is I'm going to share a little bit about the process of, of writing this book. I'm going to share a couple highlights from uh, those five years since we implemented the $70,000 minimum wage. Uh, then I'm going to uh, read a brief excerpt for you all, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Um, you can, uh, uh, through the chat function at the bottom of the screen, you can uh, submit a question or comment anytime. And uh, if there are any uh, particular uh, good questions or comments, I will read them, answer them, um, and we will go from there. And we may even uh, have a, a surprise or two uh, break in uh, to, the, to the feed from uh, one or two people if you have uh, particularly um, good questions or comments that we'd like to be able to have you share um, on your video screen. So if, if anybody wants to request that, I'm not sure that we'll be able to get to it, but we'll try. So um, just a little bit uh, about some of the amazing highlights that we've experienced um, in the five years since we've implemented our official living wage policy. Um, prior to the $70,000 minimum wage, uh, across all the employees at Gravity, we had between zero and two babies born per year across the entire company. And since we put the $70,000 uh, minimum wage into effect, um, we have had uh, 50 babies either born or announced amongst the employees of the company in five uh, short years. Um, and so uh, that's really been a phenomenal um, thing to be a part of and to see that people are using uh, the, the funds, using the fact that we do pay a living wage to have a better life. That's been really exciting. Another example is that um, we've had 70% of the people that work at Gravity report back to me and to the company that they've been able to pay down debt. Um, and in fact, we've had 30% of people at Gravity say that they've either been able to get completely debt free or at least over halfway to completely debt free. So that's been very, very exciting. We've also had an amazing situation where, um, where the people working at Gravity uh, were able to between double and triple the savings rate that they have through their voluntary uh, 401k uh, savings. Um, uh, so that's been great. And a lot of people are thinking, well, yeah, that's you know, great for your team, but what about the company? Um, I get that question a lot. And you know, there's debate over you know, what are the policies that make the most money. And I'm just gonna be honest and upfront with you and say, this policy was not designed to make more money. That was not the point of putting this policy into place. The point was, I thought it would make people's lives better if they were making more money. And I didn't think it would make my life worse if I was making less money. And so that was the point of the policy. But then um, there's a, a legitimate question of, is this economically viable? For, could other companies do it? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And the proof is that we have tripled as a company um, since we put the $70,000 minimum wage into effect. So even with having a compressed uh, wage scale prior to the $70,000 minimum wage. The people at the bottom uh, of our pay scale were making around $30,000 a year. And the people at the top were at a million and there were people in between. Um, and that's probably fairly common in our industry. Um, now the people at the very top of our pay scale um, are at $275,000 per year. And the people at the bottom are 70. So we have, you know, 
a, a multiple that's, you know, two, three, four times as much rather than uh, 10, 20, 30 times as much. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, it's, been, uh, it's been exciting to see that we've been able to triple our processing volume, the number of small businesses that we're able to serve, those types of things through that situation. So um, I do want to just as a quick uh, point of order to reach out to you all, uh, just let you know that I have not showered today. Um, I uh, meant to and it just kept getting pushed back and then we got to this, uh, this time. And so if any of you like me are really taking advantage of the quarantine today, I just wanna give a special shout out to all of you and say thank you so much for being here because I know we're all extremely busy. Um, so with that, um, I wanna just share a little bit about the writing process and then kind of what I see as the book. So I always thought that I would like to write a book, you know, someday, but I thought that it would be when I was in my 60s. Um, and I would kind of think of what I learned over my career and try to share it with the next generation. Um, I didn't necessarily expect to do it um, when I was in my 30s. But um, after the 70K announcement uh, garnered so much attention and people were so interested in what we were doing, um, I had a number of big name book publishers reach out to me and ask me to sign on with their publishing house and, and write a book. And I had some discussions, but ultimately didn't end up going that direction. Um, but I did start writing. And uh, I um, did a lot of the writing in the beginning by dictation. And I worked with my colleague at, at Gravity, Emery Wager, who um, did a lot of the editing and getting that dictation onto paper and us working through. And then I would basically give it a final read and, and give it some final touches. Um, and then we got introduced to a very talented book editor through one of the publishers that we didn't end up doing business with. And she had, I think, used to work with that same uh, person that worked at the publisher. And her name's Brooke. And she started working with me. And she's a very talented editor. So she helped me because um, a lot of the things that I wrote, there was like kind of an explanation that was needed to really make it clear and in context for the reader that didn't have all the background that I had. So Brooke went through and helped me tailor a lot. She put a lot into the book, but that was a big, big contribution was just making it very clear and readable. Um, and, then, uh, and then we decided to launch it. Um, I do want to also thank, in addition to Emery and Brooke, I want to thank Bobby and Ian from Gravity who helped put today together. And I also want to thank the hundreds of people who um, signed up to say, hey, Dan, I want you to publish your book. I want to write your book and decided to pre-order before the book even had, you know, a final title, which got changed before. And some of those people, you know, waited literally for years for me to, to get in gear and finish it. So I want to thank all those people for your encouragement. And you were a big part of why I kept coming back to that and kept prioritizing the book in spite of the fact that I did have other things that I was working on. So in terms of the book, the meaning of the book changed over the five years from when I started working on it to when I finished working on it. So when I started initially writing the book, I believed that business could shift and, and through consumer behavior, through consumer choice, through all of us becoming more aware of the purchasing decisions we make, I thought of like, hey, we're kind of voting with our dollars and we're going to start buying from companies that support our values. And I was very optimistic about that being the main platform that would solve a lot of the problems in the world that I was upset about. Things like income inequality, things like uh, a disregard for, you know, like our home here uh, that we have. The other issues that I was concerned about and I thought, well, consumer shift, consumer behavior will become more aware and that will fix that. And I do see that shift happening now, like I did five years ago, but I also became aware of companies that just don't care and are, are happy to basically change their name every couple of years, are happy to do things that are very de detrimental. I mean, there's companies in our industry, for example, that do anywhere from one to two rounds of layoffs per year and use that to squeeze the employees that they have and make sure that they'll never be able to negotiate or get a better deal. And so I became even more aware of some of the, the larger context here. And in the five years, 
it's true that we experienced so much success in exactly the areas that I hoped we would when I implemented the program. I mean, it was a success beyond my wildest dreams for gravity, for the things that I cared about. But when the, the idea got so much interest and attention, I really sought, sought my sight, sights on having a dent overall in the macro economy and, and really shifting to you know, trying to spread this message and hope that we could start to change the statistics around income inequality, around the consolidation of so much wealth and power to so few people. And unfortunately, what I found was the harder I tried and, and the harder that so many people, probably all of you are trying to address that issue, we just can't keep up with what the billionaires and the wealthy companies kind of can bring to bear. And so over those five years, that part of the story has not been as successful. And I, I talk about that in the book. I talk about how, you know, I thought this could be a model. It is a model that can work for other companies. That's absolutely true. And so it's a great book to give to your boss. It's a great book to give to a future business leader. It's a great book if you're trying to think about how can I improve my company? How can I make my company great? That's a, it's a perfect book for you. It's not a perfect book if you're looking for a solution of how can I make every other company good? Um, it can help the more of us that have these examples, we can lift it up and have a bit of a wave. Um, but that wave is having trouble keeping up with everything that's happening, um, you know, outside of that, all the forces that are opposed to that. So, you know, the meaning because of that of the book really changed. And my own beliefs changed about the fact that we do need to organize politically. We do need to get together and raise our voice in unison about how these solutions not only can work at an individual company level, but also need to be implemented at a systemic level. And so um, I don't get super deep into that part of it in the book, but I do touch on that. And I think that's a lot of where you know, my mind is going now. So if you think about, you know, the things I'm writing in, in editorials, the things I'm writing on Twitter and elsewhere, a lot of it has to do with those things. So anyway, without too much uh, further ado, I'm going to read a quick excerpt and then I'm going to open up the call to Q&A, which is my favorite and people are going to type questions and we may even have one or two break-ins if we're lucky. So um, I'm starting on my book, Worth It. Again, this is Dan Price. I'm the CEO of Gravity Payments. I'm starting on page 94. And uh, this is a book that was purchased by um, uh, uh, Tay and Val, who are two, I think, radio personalities, social media personalities in Seattle that purchased it for their book club. And uh, I am borrowing your book, Tay and Val, to, uh, to read today. So thank you for that. <laughs> in late 2010, I was named the SBA Young Entrepreneur of the Year. I flew to the White House to meet with then President Barack Obama and accept the award. I was honored and the recognition Gravity received further fueled our growth. Our coffers were filling with cash. I took the award and the influx of money as a sign that we were on the right track. It gave me license to focus even more maniacally on growing the company Lucas and I had agreed that I would start drawing a $300,000 annual salary starting in 2008. But once the recession hit, I stopped taking a paycheck. I cut back on my living expenses to the bare necessities and started drawing on my emergency savings to pay for essentials. Starting in 2009, I took a reduced salary, but as we flew into 2011, gravity having grown 50% the previous year, I began taking the full $300,000. Business was good and our prospects were high. It soon became apparent, however, that not everyone was as upbeat as I was. As 2011 drew to a close, I started getting feedback, some direct and some indirect, that some people on our team were unhappy with their pay. Some were more candid about their feelings than others, but essentially, People felt that even though they played a huge role in helping the company stay afloat through, through the recession, they were not benefiting from our newfound success. By this point, we had unfrozen wages, but raises were modest, only a few percent annually, and only given out in special cases. 
I had never stopped to think about what it would be like to work the same long hours I had been working while trying to make ends meet on a stagnant $30,000 a year salary. When I first heard about this dissatisfaction, I got defensive. I was very proud of myself for all my company's recent achievements and successes. And I thought I was doing the right things. I was trying hard to make Gravity successful while still fulfilling our promises to clients and had sacrificed so much of my time, energy, and money to do so. Those sacrifices, I told myself, had not only been for the company, but also for our employees. I could have taken the easy way out as many of our competitors did and used the recession as an excuse to sell the company or lay off 30% of our staff. I could have increased prices to our clients and ended up far wealthier. I could have engineered my way to millionairedom, becoming a 25 year old with enough money to get by without working for the rest of my life. Instead, I was grinding it out in the trenches every day and my employees evidently didn't appreciate it. At the same time, I told myself that if my people were unhappy, they could always leave. Without realizing it, I had adopted the classic market-driven thinking that a business was only responsible for paying employees enough to stay competitive. Anything less than that, and they would leave for a higher paying gig. Anything more, and I was not upholding my responsibility to maximize profit and minimize expenses. If somebody wanted to be paid more, they needed to either take on a new role that would force me to pay them more or look elsewhere for a competing offer. Frustrated, I started calling friends with business backgrounds and talking to colleagues at Gravity to ask them what they thought I should do. I wanted to see if anyone disagreed with me, but everyone seemed to have the exact same philosophy that I did at that time. I was responsible for keeping my employees happy with their pay. I was responsible for running the business profitably. If someone wanted a higher salary, they needed to either find another job or do something that would help me justify paying them more. But the more people I found who agreed with me, the less comfortable I started to feel. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. And then I thought about Rosita. Rosita had started at Gravity in 2006, just after graduating from college with a degree in finance and a mound of student loans. She'd found our job ad on Craigslist and accepted an entry level position doing data entry and underwriting. Within six months, she started adding more responsibility to her plate, eventually taking over payroll, underwriting, and risk responsibilities, and serving as a backup for our support and installation teams. Even then, I knew her salary, about $20,000 a year, didn't reflect her contributions for our, to our team but I didn't realize how much her low pay was hurting her until much later. In 2007, Lucas came to me with some distressing news. Earlier that day, he had been talking to Rosita when he noticed a bright blue book on her desk emblazoned with the words, McDonald's Crew Trainer Workbook. Was Rosita about to leave Gravity for a management job at McDonald's? If so, what did that say about Gravity as an employer? We didn't want to jump to conclusions, so we summoned Rosita to Lucas's office. We told her we knew about the training manual and asked her what was going on. She immediately burst into tears. I'm so sorry, she said. I didn't want you to find out, but I've been working a second job at McDonald's since April. I need it in order to pay my bills. After Rosita calmed down, she told us the full story. With her massive student debt, coupled with other huge expenses like rent and car payment, Rosita literally could not afford to live on her Gravity salary alone. 10 months later, she'd started at Gravity. 10 months after she'd started at Gravity, she began working nights and weekends at a McDonald's in Ballard. Half an hour's drive from where she lived. Between the two jobs, she was able to eke out a living, but she was also working 75 hours a week without any paid time off 
at least until we implemented a new PTO policy in early 2008, after which she was entitled to five days only of vacation. She hadn't told anyone since she was working a second job and had never complained about her financial situation. The training manual had ended up on her desk by accident. McDonald's had just offered her a position as crew trainer, which would mean more hours, but also more money. She'd been told to review the manual before she made a decision and had packed it in her work back earlier that day. After taking it out while trying to receive something else, she had forgotten to put it back. While trying to retrieve something else, she had forgotten to put it back. She knew Lucas had to have seen it when he'd come back by her desk and was convinced we were going to fire her, which is why she was so upset. Rosita, we don't want to fire you, Lucas said, but we also can't have you working a second full-time job. It's not good for you. It's not good for the company. What would we need to pay you for you to be able to afford to quit your other job? A lot, she said. I wouldn't expect you to pay me that much. Why don't you go home and figure out exactly how much you need and then we'll talk, I said. We want to make this work and I'm confident we can come up with a solution. The next day, Rosita told us that if we just paid her just north of $37,000 a year, she would be able to cover most of her essential expenses. It was a significant increase, roughly 38%, but it was worth it to keep a team member like Rosita. From her first day at Gravity, Rosita proved to be one of the hardest working and savviest people I know. She prided herself on staying busy and learning as much as she could so she could take on more responsibility, serve the team, and grow her own skill set. As disappointed as I was for letting her down, it didn't surprise me at all that she had managed to work a second full-time job without anyone knowing. She was a constant positive presence in the office. No matter how busy she got, she never seemed stressed. Lucas and I knew that for every dollar we paid her, she would provide 10 times that value back to the company. Lucas, Rosita, and I worked out a plan. In exchange for the raise, Rosita would start taking on more responsibility, which was, which was something she'd been asking for anyway. In addition to her previous responsibilities, she eventually started managing a team of four people and from there grew to be our head of our operations department, overseeing our risk, underwriting, accounting departments, as well as our support teams. Today, Rosita oversees our sales training and veterinary sales teams and has proved integral to the growth and sustainability of the company. I'm happy to say she's received many more raises. In 2011, while discussing my pay policies with others, I remembered Rosita's situation and I realized what was bothering me. Without noticing, I had slipped into the business mold I had told myself I was trying to avoid. I had started Gravity with a mission to do something different, to rock the foundation of an industry that wasn't working as efficiently or as responsibly as it could. I'd paved my own path in the credit card processing industry, refusing to accept a given way of doing business just because it was the way things are done. And yet here I was justifying low salaries by pointing out the status quo. I was making a six figure salary and I hadn't had to scrape by at sub $40,000 levels for some time. I'd assume that because people weren't jumping ship and the company was growing, we were paying them in line with the job market. The more I thought about the market, however, the more I started to think I was using it as an excuse to put people in an objectively bad situation when I had the money to make a difference. We had always put clients first, but was this policy really benefiting them? Who else might secretly be working a second job in an effort to survive? And how could anyone con concentrate if they were working all the time and constantly stressed about money? My pay strategy seemed out of sync with the way I had been taught to think about business. It was certainly not a win-win deal. After stewing on this problem for a while, 
I determined I couldn't stand idly by any longer. I had to do something to rectify the pain I had inflicted on my team in the name of frugality. I met with Chloe, our HR manager, to compare notes. She cautioned me to be measured. With the recession still looming large in the rearview mirror, we were all scared of overextending ourselves. We agreed on a $1 per hour across the board raise, the most we could afford at the time. More important, we set a goal for that year to average 12% raises for the company in an effort to make up for the lost raises during the wage freeze of the recession. This was a huge increase from our previous average of two to 8%. We knew we were going to give up a significant amount of profit, but we felt it would be worth it. Just this once to honor those who had gone through this, the recession without raises. Next year, we'll go back to 5%, I said. I assumed this new plan would be hard on me because it would damage our profit margin. But I was okay with that because I considered it my penance for taking advantage of my team. This self-flagellation in the form of slower growth would allow me to cleanse my conscience. I felt terrible about what I had done and wanted to redistribute the rewards of our collective success. For this reason, I was actually looking forward to a reduction in profits. The theoretical value of my share as an owner in the company would decrease due to the unjust way I had been treating them. The punishment fit the crime. In 2012, we surpassed our raise goal. And by the end of the year, we had averaged a 26% increase in salaries. Most of the people on our support teams were now earning somewhere in the 30,000 to $40,000 range. I was excited to see our team's pay go up so much, but something odd was going on at the same time. Our profit margin didn't go down as I thought it would. It went up. We brought on more clients and we retained more clients. I couldn't believe my eyes as I looked at a spreadsheet showing our annual salary expenses and our revenue side by side. The lines showing their trajectories were both going up. We were scheduled to go back to 5% pay rate, uh, percent raises in 2013 because I hadn't wanted to make promises that we couldn't afford to keep. But here we were with enough money to give the same percentage raises the following year. I knew if I didn't continue the policy, I would find myself once again tormented the idea, by the idea that I was hurting my team. In the end, a 12% average annual raises was cheerfully placed on our list of goals for 2013 we averaged 19%. So that is uh, from my book, Worth It. Um, and uh, I just read you from page 94 to page 102 um, of the book, Worth It. So I um, want to uh, then open it up to questions. Um, let me... And Dan, it looks like we have had a couple people raise their hand to ask live oh. questions. Oh, great. Can we so, try it? Yeah, we'll take Christina Haxton first. Christina, I'm going to unmute you here. All right, Christina, you should be able to ask your question. Hey, Christina, right. how are you doing? Hey, Dan, I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, what's oh. your question? Absolutely. Well, it's a two-part question. So um, I'll say it and then I'll ask the first part. So I'm curious about what was the biggest one negative impact and two pleasant unexpected surprise from the organization um, after implementing the $70,000 announcement. So the first one would be the biggest negative impact that you didn't expect. Thank you so much for that question, Christina. And, and thanks again for being here. So um, it's a great question. The number one negative of our program is what gravity is all about. What we think about 99% of the time is trying to help small businesses. And the way we do that is by level the playing field and give them a better deal. They, they don't have to pay so much money just to get paid with a credit card. And we give them white glove service. So there's no stress. They can trust us. We put a tremendous amount of effort and sacrifice into making that happen. And that's what we know ourselves for. When we as a company look in the mirror, that's what we see. But when the company is looked at by the outside world, people that don't work at the company, they see the $70,000 minimum wage and they see the 
income inequality advocacy we do. That's not a bad thing because that's important. It's an important contribution that we believe in making as a company, but it, it's not really tied to what we're doing every single day, day in and day out. We're not setting people's pay on a daily basis. We are out there on a daily basis helping small businesses. And for example, in the pandemic, you know, we're spending all of our time focused on setting up businesses with e-commerce solutions and omni-channel solutions and everything so they can continue to transact and we can take the payment away from the register or at a minimum make it a contactless payment at the register. So we've been putting all of those solutions out there, spending all our time on that, but yet, you know, the, the general population out there, the public, the media, they all know about us from the $70,000 minimum wage. So that's by far the biggest downside, I think, is just it did somewhat dilute the brand of what we were known for before and what we really think is more true about us. What we should be known for is how we stick up for small businesses. So that's first. The second thing is the, the most kind of uh, surprising thing. We, it was not on our radar at all that we were gonna have a gravity baby boom. Uh, we also had a gravity uh, real estate boom. We started to have first time homeowners working at gravity for the first time. We started having a significant number. And right after I made the announcement, um, there was a gentleman who came up to me, his name's Cody, that's worked at gravity for a long time, does such a great job uh, at gravity helping small businesses. And he told me that um, he was going to be able to move up the date of when he was going to start to, with his wife, try to have their first child because the financial plan that they had put into place could be accelerated to make that happen. That was the first little sign and it was the day, either the day of or the day after I had made the $70,000 announcement, but I would have never guessed that there would be 49 other people that would you know, make similar uh, pronouncements to us as a company. So thank you for joining us, Christina. Um, and uh, I don't know if we have anybody else queued up. Yeah, so thanks, Christina. We also have a question live from Kevin Monroe. So Kevin, I'm taking you um, off of mute right now if you want to ask your question live. And then for anyone else that wants to ask a live question, feel free to hit the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks, thanks Bobby. Dan, thanks so much for the uh, webinar today. My question, oh, I've got several, but the one I'll ask here is how has this current crisis, COVID-19, impacted your business, and to what extent are the current economic realities putting any stress or strain on the company's ability to continue this policy? Well, Kevin, um, it's been horrific um, and heartbreaking to see mm -hmm. so many small businesses uh, just get clobbered by this, um, by this pandemic, and, and also, you know, the policies that we maybe rightfully so have put into place to protect our public health systems have really hurt small businesses and it benefited large businesses. And we haven't had the policies to counteract that, um, that situation. So gravity's revenue is also a function of small business revenue, which at its bottom point was down 55%. So gravity lost half of its revenue. Mm. And at the worst time, gravity was losing $30,000 a day with literally months to survive um, before we would, we don't have that much in terms of savings or availability of debt or those sorts of things. And we certainly weren't planning on losing over half of our business in an instant. So the, the logical solutions out there uh, were number one, you have to do a layoff. And number two, you need to increase the prices that your small business customers are paying you, not because it's necessarily the right thing to do, but you have to do it to survive. And in my mind, either of those two things would kill part of the dream of why I come to work every day, why I love being here. So I really didn't want to do that. I called together all almost 200 employees at Gravity, and I shared with them that we were losing $30,000 a day, that we had months to survive, and that these were the only two solutions that cut deep enough to have any type of chance of saving us. And, um, and I didn't wanna do those things, and I, I just genuinely asked for help, and employees came up with so many ideas, and they came up with a lot of cost-saving ideas that were able to save us um, uh, about a half million dollars a month. Um, wow. $10,000 a day of cost saving pretty much instantly. 
But the other thing that the employees uh, came up with was the idea of having a spreadsheet where everybody could volunteer what they wanted to do to help the company overcome the pandemic. And one of the items that a lot of employees put on there was they asked to take an anonymous individual voluntary pay cut only to the extent that they could afford it and were willing to do it. But what blew me away was out of 200 employees, we had 196 employees sign up on an anonymous individual voluntary basis to take a pay cut. We had 10 employees asked to work for zero. We had uh, between two and three dozen employees asked to take at least a 50% 50, 50 pay cut or more. And it was very humbling. Um, and I, I cried many times from that and I was not happy about it. Um, but it was the, the only solution kind of to overcome it. And I'm really proud to say that that has helped us to extend our runway as a company. Um, and uh, when we got the uh, small business PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, we were able to restore um, uh, people's salaries or, you know, it was always optional. So we always said to people, if you wanna take the money back or restore your salary, you can anytime. And when we got the PPP, um, a lot of our employees did choose, not all of them actually, some are still on a, a pay cut, but a lot of our employees chose to put their pay back to where it was before so that they could take care of their family through this crisis, which I was really happy and proud about the fact that they increased their pay back to where it was before um, in many cases. So it, it's, been, uh, it's been really uh, difficult, but we're all hands on deck. We're, I guess in a way, working twice as hard for at least as a company revenue, sometimes half the money, because um, there's so many small businesses that need technology solutions. You know, for, I'll give you some examples. With our veterinarians, we're doing text to pay so that they can text the customer, customer can pay from their car, then they can bring the animal, the pet out to the car. We have a, a coffee shop program called Joe Coffee, where you can order your coffee ahead and it'll be waiting when you get there so that it's easier for social distancing. Um, we have restaurant online ordering. We set up more restaurants and retail stores with e-commerce and online ordering over the past eight or 10 weeks than we have in the entire history of the company. And the list goes on and on. I'm also really proud of another company that we partner with called Smile Point of Sale. They're the top uh, software company for Thai restaurants. And they've been uh, handing out PPE to their Thai restaurant clients, keeping them in business and getting them that delivery and online ordering uh, functionality that they need to keep people away from the likes of Uber Eats and Grubhub, which take 30% in some cases or a minimum 15% away from these small businesses. And they don't have the margins to absorb a 15 or 30% hit. So that's kind of how it's impacted us so far. Uh, Kevin, I'll give you an opportunity if you want to ask one follow-up and then we'll move on to see if anyone else wants to jump in. Oh gosh, but Dan, let me just say how amazing, how impressed I am to hear all of those things and the way that 196 employees stepped up voluntarily mm. to commit. That's truly remarkable. Uh, Thank you. What, what, how do you feel different about yourself and your role in leading this company through this season? What's different about the way you see yourself? Well, I think this comes across very loud and clear in the book, I hope so, but what I found was money helped me to be happier up to a point and then it didn't. And so when I was being more successful, and I was not in it for the money, I was trying to help small businesses, but I also got a personal benefit from it by making more money. And I thought that would always be the case. And now that I realize that's not the case and more money does make your life better and does make you happier up to a certain point, you know, for a family, maybe it's up to about $100,000 a year, or if you live in a very expensive place like San Francisco or New York, maybe it's 150,000 or 200,000. Right. I don't think it's more than that anywhere. Um, I had to search for other things to replace the value that I was getting in my career out of money because all of a sudden the increased money didn't have value in my career. And that caused me to lean into what's my purpose here. And I, I shared this with our team several times, but I believe that we as a company can make a bigger difference for our mission of leveling the playing field for small businesses so that they don't get raked over the coals just to get their money just to have the tools to keep up with these big technology companies. 
we can do more good for that mission in the next 16 months because of the pandemic than we could over the last 16 years. So the pandemic is a horrible crisis. I don't wanna sugarcoat that at all, but also when there's a crisis, that's when we need our heroes. And, and so we, our, our heroes in our world are small businesses. And if we can support and stick up for those people fighting for the American dream, that touches me in a way that more than replaces the value that money has lost in my life by giving up the pursuit of the Forbes list, giving up trying to compare myself to Zuckerberg or Bezos or Jack Dorsey or anybody else. And, and I'm, I'm hungry for that. Mm. I'm desperate, I'm thirsty, and I'm pushing into it as hard as I can. So thanks again, Kevin, for being here. Oh, thanks, Dan. All right. Thanks, Kevin. And then we have another live question from Ryan Mersman. So Ryan, I'm unmuting you now. And we'd love to have you ask your question. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks for taking my question, Dan. Ryan, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm, big, I'm a huge fan, great supporter. Hope to work for you someday. I hope but so I do too. have a question. <laughs> yeah, so I work at a great company. They've been very compassionate with the pandemic and letting oh, good. me work at home. Good. But I would love to start a dialogue with the executives of supporting a living wage for our employees. I started pretty low in customer service, about $12 an hour. And I've been able to work my way up the chain and make uh, a better you know, living for myself and my family. But I'd love to help others who are in that situation making a very low wage and kind of you know, help them up. How do I start that dialogue with executives? So that is such a good question, Ryan. This is literally one of the best questions I've ever gotten. And I've talked about these topics all over the world on so many stages. I love this question and I, I might try to incorporate an answer into like a blog post or something like that because it's such a good question. So a little bit of context for my answer. As the CEO, I'm the one person that you can't really tell about your personal life too much for most people. Most people are not going to go to the CEO and say a bunch of things about their personal life, especially negative things. Um, and so if you are, you know, going through a difficult time with like your health or your mental health or your financial health or anything that's tough for you, the CEO is going to tend to be one of the last people on earth that you're going to tell. But because of that, the CEO and the executives at these companies, they don't, they're out of touch with reality. I'm out of touch with the reality and I'm dependent on my team to bring me back into reality. And so sharing what you're seeing, sharing your perspective, sharing your viewpoint is so important and doing it boldly. I think you'll be surprised at how happy the executive team is, how happy the, the CEO is to hear what it was like. And in particular, I would share with them how difficult it was to survive on $12 an hour. And I would share with them how you have other choices. That can be a choice. We're going to continue to pay people $12, $13, $14, $15 an hour. That can certainly be a valid choice. But let's not pretend it's the only choice because I think most companies pretend that is absolutely the only choice available. It's not the only choice. And getting the information out there, the things from your story that show how difficult it is, not to help you because you've already exceeded that, but to help the other people that are in that situation. The CEO and the executive team, they've been removed from that reality far longer than you have. So your perspective is much more fresh. It's much more relevant to today. And they're remembering in many cases of time where things were much cheaper. And so they don't understand how unaffordable it is to live off of that amount. Sharing the data that you have to be able to get that information to them is such a critical thing. Now, of course, you know, our story and the things that I've written and, and, and this book can be a helpful guide as well. But I think the number one thing would be having you um, share your story and the stories of people that you're in touch with about how difficult it is and just letting people know this is a choice. This is not something, this is not a law. We're not gonna break a law by paying people a living wage. It's a choice that we're gonna make. Do we wanna pay a living wage? Do we, do we not wanna pay a living wage? And, and if we can get it into the conversation as a strategic choice, far more people will say yes, because right now it just gets shut down out of the gate. And I hope that that's the difference that this book makes. I hope that when people read this book, they see if you do it, as I realized, then you're choosing to do it, but also the damning part is if I don't do it, 
I'm choosing not to do it. And there's a verse, I grew up reading the Bible. There's a verse in the Bible in the book of James that says, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, that is a sin. Sin isn't about doing something wrong. Sin is about failing to do something right. It's a higher standard, it's a higher bar. And I think introducing that concept into our companies. Ryan, does that make sense? Any follow up on it? No, that's great. Thank you so much for your feedback. I'll, uh, I'll try to gather stories from my fellow coworkers and see if we can share that with the uh, execs and see how it goes. My email address is dprice at gravitypayments.com. I'd love to get more details if it's ever appropriate to share with me how those conversations go. Sweet. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ryan. All right, Dan, I'll give you the option. We have some people that have given audio um, indication that they'll ask a question live and then also a bunch in the Q&A. Your call. Do you, how, if we have enough for a quick lightning round, do you want to just go through a bunch and, and do you want to read them to me quickly? Yeah, sure. All right. First question. After reading Worth It, what is the first thing you'd encourage us to go do right away? Uh, find out what it's like to be the lowest paid worker at your company and share that information with the CEO. Perfect. Knowing this information, would you have made this change earlier in building your business? Absolutely, 100%. And I feel bad that I didn't. Dan, what are some of the most interesting shower thoughts you have had? <laughs> um, uh, sometimes I, I, I wonder, um, did I make all the right decisions? Would the world be better off if I had pursued becoming a billionaire so I could be a philanthropist? Um, I think the answer is no. I, I, I hope I'm making a bigger difference by what I'm doing. But I, I recognize the the, the loss of me not trying to become a billionaire means that I don't have as much money to give away. Okay. Why do you think it's hard for other bosses to follow you on your ideas and your example? We're taught that this is not a choice. You have to follow what everyone else does. It's wrong, but we're taught it from such a young age and we're taught not to question it. Okay. Does your minimum wage policy apply to your sales team? It does. It applies to everybody at Gravity. Um, we, um, we pay our sales team based on salary and not commissions. And we do that because we don't want our customers to come to us because somebody needed to make a commission. What effect, if any, did the 70K announcement have on people taking ownership of their tasks, projects, and willingness to help with strategy? People at Gravity were so motivated before 70K. I'd like to take credit, but they were the inspiration for the 70K. They, I don't think they were as inspired by the 70K as much as the 70K was inspired by them. What they're motivated by is helping small businesses. And Dan Pink talks about this in his great book, Drive. What people are motivated by, by is autonomy, uh, mastery, and purpose. And our team is very much into those things. But their capability was enhanced. When they had more money, they could be healthier. They could actually execute better on that motivation. So that did help productivity. Um, and also they had a greater sense of license. If you're not being paid enough to make ends meet, you're, it's a way of telling that person that they don't matter. And w once we started paying people more, then they felt like they mattered more and they started to raise their hand and question things that we were doing at the company more. So it did help productivity, but I would say the motivation was already there before. And then we have a couple comments, not questions from people saying, Really appreciate what you're doing. Love hearing the gravity story. Can you tell us more about your services? Yeah, so um, basically anybody that has to accept a credit card to get paid, we can help. We just make it cheaper to get paid. And we've been doing that for 16 years. I started the company because a coffee shop owner in Caldwell, Idaho named Heather Hempel was being overcharged on her credit card processing. And my band when I was growing up played at the coffee shop and she was complaining to me about it and I helped her out with it. That's why we started the company. So we've been doing that for 16 plus years. But the thing that we do now that's pretty cool is we partner with software companies that are creating solutions to help small businesses keep pace with the larger businesses, especially in the pandemic, but really in the, in the digital age, this really is an essential thing. And we embed our payments technology in there. Now our competitors do that, but they do it in a way of trying to take advantage of those small businesses by having a monopoly on that payment technology there. So we have to beat them to that. And we have to get those software companies to integrate their, their service to Gravity Payments before they do to one of our competitors that's not gonna treat the small business well. Because once you get the integration done, it's pretty hard to change it. 
And so we have uh, something called our Small Business Champion Program. You can Google Gravity Payment Small Business Champion. You can sign up on our website to refer business to us, or you can just do it out of the kindness of your heart in the same place. The other thing that's very valuable is getting in touch with those software companies, because a lot of times once the software companies do the development work, they don't have the bandwidth to change it. And we're seeing that every day and we're seeing software companies that integrate to a larger company that all of a sudden start overcharging the merchants. And at that point, it's very hard for the software company to make the change, make the shift. So those are the main things that we do. Uh, but the mission is all about sticking up for people that are fighting for the American dream, sticking up for underdogs, sticking up for people that aren't getting the best, most fair shake. Do you sense an increasing appetite for conscientious practices in the larger market? In everyday people, absolutely. Everyday people out there are more hungry than ever to solve these problems. And I, I'm really uh, thankful. I am hearing more and more a focus on me mental health, well-being. I'm, I'm thankful that we're starting to recognize that our lives shouldn't be all about work. It shouldn't be like we shouldn't define our value as human beings based on work. Those are all positive things. But I'm telling you that uh, the corporations, the wealthy people, and the politicians that those people fund are very much on the other side of that equation. And so I used to see it as a collaborative win-win thing where we can all work together and we can all win. But unfortunately, the people with the wealth and power are using their wealth to create more power. And that's creating a situation where even if the general public, myself and all of you believe in those things, we have a real bona fide opponent that is a threat. And I don't know that we're making progress fast enough. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, even though I'm so happy that these issues are gaining so much prominence and income inequality, and unfairness is such a larger topic of conversation now than it was five years ago, and I'm thankful for that. You have publicly available data demonstrating the growth and productivity rates pre and post 70K? We do. Um, Nick Kristoff from the New York Times in 2014 gave the most up-to-date data at that point, but the publicly available data that you seek is in my brand new book, Worth It. Um, and uh, if there's anything that you would like to know that's not in there, let us know and we'll do a blog post about it. Dan, what would you attribute the success of Gravity to following the move to balance the salaries to 70K? I would say that we already had a mission we were passionate about, sticking up for those fighting for the American dream, sticking up for small businesses, fighting against monopolies, fighting against you know, people who are basically trying to charge a toll to people that can't afford it just so that they can have more money, basically fighting against greed. And we were all united around that to start with, and so we had a mission that mattered to us as a company, and then we needed the pay rate to kind of support that mission. So those two working together help the company. If you're working at a good company with good services, that's trying to do the right thing, and you implement a living wage, they'll work synergistically together. One will help the other. Um, if you're working at a company that is like doing something that probably is bad for humanity, I don't have experience with that. So I would say that the togetherness of our team and I just have to acknowledge, I mean, it's just so basic, like the people that work at Gravity and our customers that support us by doing business with us, you are the reason that all this works. You're the reason I have this platform. Um, I'm uh, thankful and proud to be a part of this team, but um, I get far too much credit. This should not be something that I get positive attention for. This should be normal because each and every one of you deserve everything you're getting. Given the pandemic, which industry or small business type can you make the biggest difference for right now? Um, I would say uh, restaurants, coffee shops, dentists, um, any type of service or professionals, um, uh, veterinarians, um, all of those. But where we can really make a difference is if we get involved with a business association where there's a bunch of businesses coming together or uh, get involved with a software company that's making software for a lot of small businesses that has a payments component embedded in it where you pay while using a software because just a software company with no payments will cheer them on and do everything we can to raise their profile but we can't actually from a business standpoint help but if the software has some component where we can help them make payments more seamless that would be the absolute number one thing where we can make the biggest difference is making sure that we're doing that and it's not some company that's gonna flip the script and do a, you know, we had a competitor square recently just decide because they wanted to, to increase their fees on all their customers and they just did it just 
in one foul swoop. And that's the way our industry operates. That's how we're encouraged to operate. So getting involved with those software companies early that have that payments component embedded in. Another one I'll call out is lawyers. We uh, have all these special tools where lawyers, they have different monies that need to go to trust account versus operating account. But really any industry that accepts a lot of credit cards, we don't do porn, gambling, or drugs. Um, but beyond that, we do almost every industry, any small business, small player in that, we'd rather stick up for the small uh, person than uh, the huge corporation. Great. And Dan, we're at 2.30 Pacific time. So your choice, whether you want to take uh, any more. Or... I I'll leave it there. But I just want to thank everybody so much for being here today. Um, thank you so much for supporting me and Gravity. Um, it's really nice to take a little break and spend some time together. And uh, let's stay in touch. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, so I'd love to stay in touch with you there. Um, you can buy the book at profitisnotapurpose.com, but we are encouraging everybody to just call up your local bookstore and buy it from them because they need the money more than we do. And what's important to me is not so much the money from the book, but getting the message out there. Of course, you know, the, the, the royalties that we get are, are helpful to us as well, but that's not why we're doing it. You know, we just want to be sustainable as a company, but we really want to get this message out there. Um, and so you all can help us do this. Give a copy to your boss, give up a copy to your boss's boss, maybe leave it on their desk anonymously with a note that they really need to read it if you don't want to get credit for giving it to them. Um, and, and share with your friends so that they can do the same thing. The most important uh, and the, the most satisfying thing is when people tell me about something from the book that made a difference for them. And that's true with all of my speaking, everything. There have been times where I've both been really sick of attention and also been criticized by people that claim that I really want attention, that I'm doing this for attention. And my reaction to that has been, okay, well, then I'm going to stop doing it because, you know, I just don't, you know, I have other things to do with my time. I'd much rather hang out with my nieces and nephews and, and then try to go get the most attention possible. That doesn't seem like a good way to spend my life trying to get attention at any, by any means necessary. And so I, I, at times, I'll be honest, I've thought about quitting uh, speaking out so much or decreasing it greatly. And what keeps me speaking out, what keeps me engaging with all of you is first and foremost, the relationship that I get to have with you and the connection that we get to have. But secondly, it's the difference that it makes. And every time I get a note about even some small change, somebody came up to me the other day and told me they quit their job because of, of some things that I'd written. That meant a lot to me. Somebody else came up to me and said that they had doubled their pay of their lowest paid employees. In fact, most recently, I can't say who, but there's a pharmacy in the Midwest, in a rural part of the Midwest, that doubled their pay for their lowest paid employees after hearing about the story and after spending some time talking to me on the phone. So those are the things that keep me coming back. But even if you just tell me, oh, I like this part or I didn't like that part, anything that shows me that you're engaging with the content, that you're wrestling with it, that you're coming to your own conclusions, one of the best pieces of advice I got early in life was don't take advice. And it sounds like an oxymoron, but what it means is be humble, listen to my perspective, but then look inside, look at your conscience, look at the way you were raised, look at what you care about, the life you want to create, the world you want to create, and do what you think is the right thing. And so I would just, uh, it would just mean so much to hear, hear from all you about those types of, you know, in-depth kind of wrestling that you're doing with the content. So to Bobby, Ian, Brooke, everybody else that helped put this on today, thank you so much. Uh, to everybody that was able to join, thank you. I think we're going to try to probably post this publicly somewhere if, uh, if those uh, that were able to jump in don't mind at some point. But uh, I just appreciate everybody being here and let's stay in touch and wishing you the best of health, especially for you and your family in the midst of the pandemic. We got this, y'all.